Maybe. Hey, Jay. How are you doing? Good. How about you? All things considered, pretty good. As it goes, I'll yep. change, I'm going to change my Four Seasons background to something more social. <laughs> Here, how about this? Yeah, that's social. Or just a little retro. Very retro. Or I happen to like this one. Yeah, that's a good one. <sighs> we bought one of the, we have two green screens in the house now. We have one pull down one that's behind April. And basically we have a pull down one that looks like a roller, you know, it's full movie projection size. It hang, I, and, I, and then I hung cables from, oh, we have a wood ceiling, a nice wood ceiling. So I hung cables in three different locations in the flat. So it can be behind April at her desk, which is what we're, that, that's the default setting. It can be in a place, the only place kind of in the flat where we can stand in front of it uh, and, and have a camera in front of us on a tripod. And then behind me sitting at the chair that I usually sit at. Um, and then we also bought one of the big oval flop open ones, which are impossible to close if you're one person. They are <laughs> like, it says, in, it says on Amazon, like, you know, kind of tough. It's like, no, no, no. One person's not going to close this unless they're Samson and, and really nimble. Cause it, you know, it's, it's, it's got very, very robust wire. And I was using that here and it turns out that CPUs and uh, Zoom's algorithms are good enough that don't, don't need the green screen anymore. And it was really like kind of cumbersome and annoying to move in and out and set up and tear down and all that. So now I'm, I'm like just defaulting to, to this, which is more fun than the boring place I am sitting in. I'm, I'm a little jealous. I have a, my, my main computer is a 2015 um, MacBook Air and, and the CPU doesn't, doesn't go there. And then yeah. I have a newer one, uh, 2017 MacBook and it too doesn't have enough oomph. Well, I would, hi Judy. Well, I was I was on I was on a call day before yesterday, I guess, with Sunil, you know, Sunil Malhotra and uh, a new friend, Richard Merrick, Merrick, um, who is awesome. And at the end of the call, I discovered that both of them own the new M1 Max. They just got them. And I, I'm like, I, what? So jealous. <laughs> I uh, literally checked one out at uh, like I, I bought it at B and H, but. Then I started to look at, there's a bunch of stuff that's not compatible with it yet. And I'm like, yeah. I can't but use it, it But yet. apparently even in emulation mode, if it, if it fails emulation, you're, you're cooked. But even in emulation mode, it's faster than, than older yep. hardware. Yep. So that's pretty good. That seems awesome. to me like, seems like a big I'm, win. I'm looking forward to when I, can, when I can get one. I'm looking forward to getting a gig so I can get one. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Morning. Very nice Happy to see Thursday. you. Interplanetary, interplanetary faces. Yeah. Charles is on a space station orbiting home planet. <clears throat> Happy Hanukkah, everyone. Yeah. Happy Hanukkah. Um, hey, Rob. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing okay. I'm doing pretty well. Um, I think I think everybody knows my I lost my mom last Saturday. She um, uh, the way I describe mom's life is sort of as an arc. She had a she had a bumpy ride up. She had, she had a really nice flight through the middle, and then she had a bumpy ride down. Um, and unfortunately, I was sort of the manager of her bumpy ride down because she refused to do any planning and also refused to acknowledge. That anything was going wrong and also started getting paranoid so all of that combined to make some for some challenging bittersweet moments on the way down so last year for example on a, i did a i did a day trip to la and checked my emails at noon and messages at noon and she had sent me 15 texts and emails wondering if i was dead where i was and i had told her just going for the day etc cetera, etc cetera. and then Three days before that, her neighbors had called 911 twice on her because they found her outside in the rain in her slippers and robe looking for me in the parking lot, mm. just disoriented. And I had told her, like, I'll be right back. Like, so, so that's, what, that's why she was in assisted living. Um, 
and this, year, this year. Mm -hmm. um, so, so mom's passing was, was kind of, um, my, my dad died in 83 suddenly um, after surgery. So, so that was, that was like painful in a different way. Mm -hmm. And this was more natural and she's in a more peaceful place. And my, yeah. and the thing, I, I don't know what the afterlife is or if there is one or anything like that. I, the, the one thing I know for sure is she's no longer a prisoner of her body and her mind, which we're not right. helping, not helping her anymore at this stage. Um, so that's good. And then, and then everybody's been so fabulous with, with condolences and help and conversations and all that. Um, that that's been wonderful. So, um, and, and last thing, which is actually really relevant to OGM, um, my, my management of her soft landing was eating like a quarter of my cycles, uh, emotionally, attentionally, uh, all of that. And I get those back to be more present here uh, and, and so forth. So that's actually a good thing. She was a firecracker, Jerry. I, I really loved uh, when yeah, she, was she was at retreat or uh, on the mailing list. It was like, damn, that's smart. <laughs> she was awesome. I was trying do, to do you have some example there, Pete? Uh, I could go back to the mailing list and, and probably find something, yeah. I don't have anything offhand. Yeah. Uh, Mom somehow uh, just, th this is a piece of something slightly different, but uh, somehow mom found style like in the world. And uh, so I grew up in Peru, uh, in Lima, Peru, my first 10 years. And we had Vogue and Bazaar on the coffee table. And that, that'd be interesting, except uh, mom would take pages from Vogue and take them to her, to her uh, dressmaker and say, can you do this? Uh, and boom, there'd be like, like a, a knockoff in her own custom fabric or whatever of, of some really cool thing. Uh, and it wasn't that she was knocking off like Givenchy and whatever. It was just like good looking stuff that looked great on her. So I did that album and some of those dresses and outfits and like the yep. midriff out, outfits and all that, those were, <laughs> those were done by mom taking a picture to her hairdresser. And then I don't know how, but mom heard about Knoll furniture and Knoll was sort of expensive modernist furniture. And in, in this day when they didn't really have, they sort of never had savings or anything like that. They kind of lived from, from budget to, to, to living. But mom bought a bunch, a bunch of Knoll furniture and had it shipped to Peru. And so I grew up surrounded by the Aero Sarn and the pedestal table, the Wait, big oval table yeah. and, the, and the tulip chairs. Yeah. I, that was my dining set. And the big womb chairs from Knoll, those were our living room comfy chairs. And we just, you know, I could curl up in there, like five of me could curl up in there comfortably. Um, and I have no siblings, but, but all of that. And so the house was beautifully decorated and I'll, I'll add a little story. Um, so we had three houses that we rented in Lima. Uh, the, we were in the middle house when mom went to visit a house that was for rent and uh, with no intention of moving whatsoever. And it was this big place out of town a ways. Uh, and it was owned by an art collector who had an antique store downtown where we happened to have bought a chess set, which we still have, which I still have now. Yeah, um, beautiful and, chess set. And her name was Gra Graciela La Lafi. Uh, so we called this the Lafi house. And mom went to see it and it's like, that's really cool, but we can't afford it. It was like more than twice the rent we were paying. So then Graciela sort of invited herself over for coffee and uh, kind of checked mom out and saw what mom had done with the place and said, uh, we'll, give it, we'll give you this place for the same rent you're paying now. And anything that you see in the house, any antiques, you can keep them out. Like anything you don't want to use store, but whatever you want to use, keep. And so there were all kinds of like beautiful wood furniture and some, some Gipus in frames on the wall and all kinds of cool stuff. So mom blended modernist with re really antique in those kind of dim pictures. I don't have good quality mm -hmm. photos of them, but you, if you went through the photo album, <clears throat> you'll see some photos of interiors and that's the blend of old and new. And it was glorious. And I, I just feel really fortunate, A, that I, that I had that. And I, have, and I have no idea where mom found that because the rest of the family uh, on both sides is not particularly aesthetic. Right, my dad was a good painter, and he, he had a really good eye for stuff. But but nobody else, like my mom's parents, uh, looked like Germans, um, just normal, you know, normal everyday dressers and, and everything else. And and so, so I don't know where it comes from, but I'm happy that it was there. It certainly was colorful. I I especially like that little clipping from the paper where she riffed on liking her old car instead of the new ones that beeped and yelled at you and did all kinds of stuff. 
and that's why she was still driving her 20 year old car. Exactly. Thank you. And that, that was from the days when getting a letter to the editor published in a magazine was a big deal. So yes, exactly. That, that was exactly what that was. So like, Ooh, look. Um, so that's kind of by way of my check-in, I guess. And uh, I'm happy to be here and, and let's take a, a path. Um, let's take a path up the, up, the, up the gallery here and start with Julian, Ken and Scott. So I'm uh, still struggling with importing the secret, the ACM SIGGRAPH digital library into Neo4j, um, which is a, a big step that I need in order to get some useful information out of that database. So that's my check-in. So. Thank you. Uh, good luck. Do you, are you stuck on any particular thing? Is it just... Just uh, getting one frame of thought to get along with another frame of thought. That mm. sounds like the condition of the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, Ken, Scott, Kevin. Hello, everybody. Um, boy, I love that. Getting one thought to get along with another thought. That is definitely the condition in my mind these days. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot to say. I've been enjoying, I've had uh, the last two days, um, team one has been meeting and we've been going over our um, uh, our giant Miro board and trying to make some sense of making sense. Um, and I think we're we're coming along. We still have quite a ways to go, but um, we had on, on a couple of things that I thought were really interesting. One was we came up, Jerry was, was talking and mentioned this word about civilization building, which just really fired my imagine up my imagination up about um, one of the things I think that sets OGM apart from people who are working on business. Um, we really want to uh, have that larger arc of civilization building. So that's kind of got my, my mind fired up about OGM. And uh, that's, you know, it's, um, we're still waiting for some rain down here. It's been very dry in California. And uh, supposedly there's some rain on the way in the next few days or Got our fingers crossed because fire season is not over yet, and um, you know the last thing we want to do is have another drought on top of on top of the pandemic. So um, you know we're we're hopeful. Um, However, it is cold enough to to note that you're inside instead of out on the patio. Yeah, that's been going on since um, mid November. Yeah, it's been about a month. That uh, it's just too too. You know, it's in the fifties out there. So I, if I were if I were really rugged, if I were like young and still living in Maine when I was where I was growing up, that'd be not a problem. But you know, I'm I'm old and cold. So uh, anyway, it's great <laughs> to see everybody. Thank you, and I'll. I'll try to send some of our rain down because our forecast right now, I looked at the app this morning, it's like little clouds with drippy things for the next 10 days. Like apparently there's some rain in our forecast so we can send it down to you. Um, Scott, Kevin, Rob. Hey everybody. Um, so I'm kind of in a, working on my own sort of state at the moment, which happens when I want to try to synthesize something. I, I find it difficult to include too many other people when I do that. Um, what I've been working on is this set of meta skills for uh, young people. So um, thinking tools, basically building the, or, or equipping them with the building blocks of thinking. And one of the things I mentioned to Ken, I think it was, Ken and I had a conversation and I suggested that the problem wasn't that kids couldn't solve problems. It was that they couldn't turn a mess into a problem. And it's the idea that, that it's, it's the creation of the problem, the selection of the problem that's actually the bigger deal. And as you, as you start to look at reality, that's, what, that's how reality presents itself. It doesn't present itself as a little bundle of certainty with a correct answer. It's, it's a mess and you have to actually formulate a problem. Um, and so that, that's kind of what I've been thinking about. And then I was walking through the grocery store and there was a headline in the newspaper and it was talking about the, uh, the, um, the word is escaping me. The thing that we're now taking to prevent the virus. Vaccine? Vaccine. <laughs> yeah, 54, you know, comes and goes. Um, anyway, and the headline was 50 states, 50 plans. And I thought that that was an interesting amalgamation of what I've been thinking about, um, which is, okay, there's no, there's no way to do this. You know, you have to 
every individual has to figure out a way to do this. Okay, you know, well now every state is having to figure out a way to do this. And that also fit well, I thought, with the idea of quests, as we're talking in, in the OGM sense, in that, well, if he may, you know, is there a central way of doing it? Is there a central plan? Or is it we've provided these tools, the vaccine, and now you use your best judgment to to implement with that that tool. So Thanks, Scott. And there's these eternal kind of planning and management conundra, like should things be federal or centralized or should it be the decentralized, right? Or federalized or whatever the right word is. And then I come back to things like slavery. Should slavery be an option by state? Like, should you be able to move to a state <laughs> that, that has slavery? It's like, mm, no, mm. That, 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 one's, that one's sort of the easy, one of the easiest ones for me. Uh, mm. but, but how much do you delegate out you know, in a decentralized way and how does that work? And then from an OGM and a design from trust perspective, the more you can trust the fingertips, the better. The more you can create systems that rely on local intelligence, local knowledge, local context, the better. Because most problems are, are better understood by the people who are there. And if you look at Lynn Ostrom's principles for governing the commons, one of them is like, let the people who are on the commons, closest to the commons, do the, the, the structuring of, of the commons. I had heard that said like the front line is always right. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> In a sense. Yeah, which isn't entirely true, but I believe yeah. Judy Judy had said similar things as she's this balance between the high level and the local mm -hmm. to make sure that we're also accommodating what's going on in that. And I put some links that might be good resources for you, Scott, in the chat. I put in like, what should we learn is a thought in my brain where I've attached a bunch of stuff <clears throat> and also how to ask better questions or all sorts of movements about asking better questions. Uh, and they're all under life advice, which is a huge thought, so. Um, if you're interested. Um, Klaus, Kevin, Rob. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's not the order I had before, but you've all, you all have moved in my window. I think it's Kevin, Rob, Klaus. How about that? <laughs> okay, good. I'll go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're getting a lot of traction on this friends and family fund uh, for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich aunt or uncle. And uh, there seems to be this national phenomenon that we're going to be able to localize that uh, the folks we're working with can't get a Kiva loan because they don't have 25 friends with $25 <clears throat> to put up on Kiva. And so we're, we're getting, we've got a, a new young guy who wants to, black guy wants to lead the expansion of it. And I think we can do that Kiva analysis with that, all those accelerators to make that people aware of it. Uh, there's also a guy uh, from Duke who's doing this national landscaping of impact funds. And <clears throat> they did the, Capital stock construction, big project finance to private equity venture to, to Series A, to Series, you know, to seed, and then they said friends and family. I said, well, what if they don't have a rich uncle? And you know, he's from Duke, and so like the concept of not having a rich relative couldn't commute, compute to him. And so I think you know our message is to those folks, the folks who build the funds don't realize why their loans aren't going out because we have capital that is equity. To make people eligible to get a loan. So, anyway, I've got some allies linking up around that. <clears throat> One other odd thing that I'm in this this Facebook group of left leaning Itawambians in really poor county in Mississippi where I'm from. <clears throat> um, it went 88% for Trump, and people say that about 12% of the people wear masks, and it looks like about eight. Oops, Kevin, you first. Percent of the people are um, skeptical of the vaccine. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me? I'll turn off my video. Yes. Can... Yeah, turn off so the it, video. It seems like about 88% of the people are skeptical of the election and the vaccine. Right? I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you hear me? So, so anyway, it's like, it, it, it like, like about all the Trump folks. Okay, so it seems like um, about all the Trump folks are skeptical of the, are pointing, uh, posting pictures on Facebook of themselves with a handgun saying, I'm going to Georgia to defend the Second Amendment. Wow. So anyway, it, that, you know, that's, whole, that's the view from home. Thanks, Kevin. This whole thing is such a twisty, turny thing. And I think today is the day, today's safe harbor, is that right? Um, Tuesday was safe harbor. Tuesday was safe harbor. So the today mm -hmm. or tomorrow is another deadline that locks things in. And for, yeah. on the 14th, yeah. the 14th, the 14th is when they vote. Yeah. 
And then Congress certifies sometime in like January 6th or something like that. Yeah. Um, Kevin, have you done stuff on ownership, just uh, sort of shared ownership structures uh, like uh, land trusts and other kinds of things? Yeah, I've, I have. And land trusts are okay, but, you know, like the Somalis don't want it because you can't get a retirement out of it because you share that land. There's a thing we're doing in Chicago that looks pretty interesting. It's an idea by a guy in the neighborhood that we're working in where older people will um, pool their home equity uh, in neighborhoods where it's running down and there's a lot of empty houses to create down payments for other folks to come in on their block who then makes their house more, uh, their, secures their asset. And so our equity fund might do a renovation uh, equity after that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then one other thing that is really cool there, we're trying to bring in from Baltimore, uh, this woman's got uh, uh, black folks wanting to move back to black neighborhoods. And so she's got 30 people doing pre-committed home ownership demand to then transform a block. Um, and we're wanting her to come alongside. So there's there's things like that. But you know, for a lot of poor folks, land trusts are not good because that's their only asset and it's their only intergenerational transfer. And so wow. it's, it, theoretically it works, but that's because they don't have any other asset and don't have money in a bank. Right, right. Thank you. That's but it's, it's a cheap way to get in. It's just that you, you, you can't pass it on. Right, right. That's, that's super interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, Rob Klaus Hank. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I am, uh, Jerry, I appreciate hearing your stories. My dad passed a few years ago with Alzheimer's. So kind of, uh, I wasn't the primary kind of day-to-day -day person, but definitely uh, can, can uh, relate there in terms of the arc. I uh, thought that was an interesting way to, uh, to talk about it. Um, I've been trying to get back into photography, which is a passion of mine. And I found that over, the summer, I've been doing a lot less of it. And so I think uh, well, maybe for some obvious reasons, but not necessarily so, right? We, we uh, kind of have to push our creative boundaries and um, I'm maybe feeling like I'm coming out of a shell a little bit, so that's good. Um, I think you all know I work in and around the federal government. Uh, so the government is posed to shut down tomorrow, uh, but the house did pass a uh, one week extension that likely the Senate will pass and the president will sign. And I thinking, common thinking is that there may well be a shutdown next Friday. Um, but of course, with all the craziness, none of this ever gets reported or, um, so it's interesting how a federal government shutdown used to be such a big news. And now it's uh -huh. just like, eh, <laughs> you know, who cares? Uh, that is so we'll, crazy. We'll see how that uh, plays out next week. Um, I'll, uh, if anything interesting happens, I could send a note to the, to the mailing list or something, but, uh, um, it doesn't affect our business too much. Um, even when the government shuts down, there's whole hosts of scenarios and things of what stays open and what shuts down. And a lot of our work is in Homeland Security, which mostly stays going and, um, it gets into kind of arcane details from there. Um, I, I continue to be shocked at the number of people that are maintaining the view that there was wide scale fraud and voter you know, corruption and uh, that whole Texas filing a lawsuit and all the other states joining on is just kind of blowing my mind. Um, I don't think anything will come of it, but I think it's just really breaking the country. I mean, it, it, I think a lot of us thought things would get better after the election, a couple of weeks, we calm down and, and it's just the opposite. I mean, that 20 to 30% is just on, on a different wavelength, so. Agreed, it's really, know. it's deeply it's concerning. Just, it just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I was pretty convinced there was gonna be violence in the streets in mid-November. So I'm very happy that didn't materialize. Really, really happy that didn't materialize. Now I think there's going to be like a schism in the church. There's going to be like the the East, Eastern Orthodox America, and then like this this uh, split off piece of country that is running a parallel government that has no authority, 
but has will cooperate on nothing whatsoever in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of climate change you know in the middle of horrible stuff going on so this and just just shocking that some of the republican uh politicians are standing by trump still I, I, the best read I've got on this is that this is a form of loyalty test, that 72 million people voted sort of apparently for Trump, and that other Republicans are, are scared completely out of their wits, that if they right. buck Trump and recognize Biden as the president, the survey that, that shocked me was 29 Republicans out of the 249 Republicans will acknowledge that Biden has won the election. 31 of them will acknowledge it when the Electoral College has voted. <laughs> So the numbers don't go up any better, right? And and it's like, how do we actually run a democracy? Like, how, how, so so there's there, there's a real schism, uh, a real break in the country that that yeah. uh, is it's totally not getting better anytime soon. Exactly, exactly. Thanks, um, Klaus Hank Charles. Yeah, I guess some of the turmoil that's in the that's in the society in general is reflected uh, in in my experience I just had uh, last week and this week. Um, I'm, I'm doing a webinar for business climate leaders, citizen climate lobby on uh, soil and soil restoration. And uh, that's centered around the Coal and Climate Solutions Act, which is a piece of legislation that's already in both houses and has bipartisan support. And it would basically circumvent the farm bill by fun funding farmers to change their practices. And this is a, on a national scale. I mean, this is a big deal. Um, and the bill is really gaining traction. And we got joined by <clears throat> the, uh, the returning peat poor volunteers. And I never uh, heard of this group, but um, these, are, these are highly motivated volunteers. Uh, I mean, these are people who work all over the world and, and uh, come back into retirement and they're so alarmed you know, that they want to re-engage. And they familiarize themselves with the topic because some of them are also CCL volunteers. And they're now so animated you know, that uh, I had a marketing meeting yesterday to, to uh, promote the event. And we have people coming in who are marketing specialists, you know, media specialists who really want to, to get going with this. So it's, it's uh, I mean, it's a, to me a, a reflection of how alarmed people really are. And at the same time, um, we have to also understand that this bottom up pressure that is building here with, with so many volunteers is going to impact industry. You know? Uh, certainly in the food, the food business, as I was saying, so is as um, vulnerable to change as is the energy sector. You know, you, you have fortunes that, uh, that are at stake here for people who, uh, who, I mean, multinational corporations who are, have vested interests uh, that, that we haven't been really so aware of, right? Everybody understands the energy system, we don't understand the food system. And I think, I think these things are connected. You know, I think that uh, the 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 rate of change, the the uh, the, the uh, impact of change, is threatening uh, the, uh, these industries, um, is causing a backlash. Where uh, the the uh, uh, control over the political process is really at stake here. You know, and if Biden comes in. Uh, there's already all kinds of, of things primed that will go off like a, like a shot uh, once that administration see, is seated. <clears throat> in, a good, in a good way or in a bad way? Um, in a good way, in a good way. I mean, starting with Kerry, you know, in, in uh, rejoining the Paris Accord. And I was in a meeting yesterday that was hosted by the United Nations with uh, the 4 per 1000 organization. And the Europeans, uh, they, they have submitted a proposal where European communities, cities in, in Europe, um, who, who have no capacity to sequester carbon into soil because their soil is already healthy and saturated, are going to partner with cities and communities in Africa, in Asia, and get and, and, and obtain carbon credit by helping them restore you know, the environment and their soil. I mean, these are massive, these are massive things. 
that um, that will you know, impact how uh, other countries are, are uh, formulating their food system in, in, in contrast to the industrial you know, uh, effort. Anyway, it's busy. It sounds fabulous. I love, I love all the energy and, and attention and, and resources that are showing up. Um, I sh so I'm, I'm now sort of able to focus a, a little more on OGM. And one of the things that, we're, that I'll start doing over the next week or two is shaping up quests, like what is a quest? And one of the quests is sort of like, what is our organizational structure? How does that work? So we're, I'll, I'll post that to the, to the list and to the discourse. Uh, but I think we clearly have a food system quest uh, that we need to shape up. So I'd like to do that in a way that gives you more resources to draw on in OGM, Klaus, because we have a lot of people who care about this. You've clearly been sort of the, the tip of the spear, to use a bad, bad analogy here for us. But uh, I think one of the important things OGM can do is, ta is, is to help accelerate the dissolution of the world's large problems. Uh, in whatever ways, whatever with whatever skills we have. Yeah, I actually have uh, a specific thought. You know, I'm connected now with two OG, with two NGOs. Who uh, one one is focused on farm community on on supporting small farmers. You know, this lady is already supporting three thousand farmers in South America, and these are small scale groups to to uh, uh, big become commercially viable, even on their little level. And then another group is, is uh, which is uh, intentional communities. <coughs> and uh, um, the, the idea would be to join uh, into a concept where um, intentional rural communities become a design, you know, concept design. Um, and that originated in our uh, 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 session, uh, this whole thing that um, we could spin this out. Um, and that could really be scaled, you know, if we can get funding and, and, uh, and also the professional support to make, to create a concept that is presentable. That sounds great. I love both of those initiatives. They sound awesome. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Hank, Charles, Lauren. <laughs> oh yeah, so good morning, everybody. Um, I think I have found myself, I mean, in, in all of my check-ins for the past couple of weeks, I've really just been talking about <laughs> thinking about how people are talking to each other and discourse and all that stuff. And um, I think that I have just kind of started to ask myself as I've been trolling through social media where you tend to see obviously like very one side, like super far one side or super far the other. Um, opinions that are obviously meant to, to get you like thinking um, or at least spur a quick thought, um, you know, and naturally leave a lot of context out because you only have X amount of characters or, you know, a little square inch of, of room to, to show your stuff. And I've just found myself asking like, what would have to be true for me to think that this is the case, you know? Um, not what is true, but what would have to be true for me to actually believe this or like feel strongly enough to put this forward, which hasn't like led to, it's led to a little bit of frame breaking in internally, you know, um, but not, you know, it hasn't like wholly convinced me of some of the absolutely ridiculous points of view that I see. Um, but it's been an interesting exercise for me and it's kind of, it's, it's gotten me to, it, it's felt like very OGM -y, um, and it's gotten me to think about just like the, the concept of like humility of thought that bounces around in some of the conversations that we have, you know, where we, um, I think we're all pretty, cl pretty clear and thorough thinkers. Um, but are open to the idea that we're not 100% right <laughs> and that we haven't thought about every single thing um, or every single point of view, um, which is good. So it just kind of made me feel like good about the just being in this space and being surrounded by these kind of by, by you guys. So uh, appreciate that. Um, just a, another thing I have been thinking a lot about some of the conversations in our Tuesday calls about how we're using our how to engage in like the, the OGM you know, communication ecosystem in the best way. Um, not, and that's honestly just a plug to tell you what I'm thinking about. I don't have anything super substantive to, to share there. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, 
I'll, I'll concede the rest of my time. So uh, thanks to our colleagues from the other states. Um, Hank, there's a there's a, a a guy I back on Patreon. His name is Ty Wells, and he runs a podcasty thing, an interview series called Let's Chat, which I think I've mentioned on one or two long ago OGMs. And he basically sets up a table and some cameras and nice mics in front of a church, a mall, or something like that in some place. And his opening question is, what is something you believe in 100%? Mm -hmm. And he's a rhetorician. So he then says, that his, his next question is, OK, so 100% means you're completely solid on this. What, what could happen to shake that, that belief? And he walks yeah. down that path with people to, to see if he can sort of slowly open up how they think about stuff or what their belief systems are. So it's pretty cool. Um, and that, that's just his, his MO. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Lauren Neal. Hey everyone, um, great to be here. Um, yeah, picking up on this uh, communication ecosystem, I am gearing up into this uh, beat reporting mode. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of the, the discourse forum in particular and also bridging the um, CSC Agora. And just to say, I'm, I'm excited, I have energy. I've been talking quite a bit with Pete Kaminsky and others um, and getting some good engagement on some threads, um, seizing the reins there. Um, so more to come there. I'm not minding edging towards saturation is, is my thought of the moment there. Um, I have a capacity so far. Um, I, yeah. So I had an outdoor lunch uh, today, freezing with my ex-wife, the mom of my kids, um, and we were on great terms. I was delivering candles for Hanukkah, um, and we, but we, we found some spontaneous time to kind of bond in the co-parenting mode. There's some always various uh, issues and things to discuss um, with the kids. Um, um, I'm, I'm not very religious, but I did um, also for the first time since the pandemic uh, visit the rabbi yesterday um, without really going into much of the story. It was just kind of meaningful to connect and also have some um, interaction there. Our older daughter is sort of um, soonish heading into uh, bat mitzvah preparation time. So there was some, some things there. And other things like that uh, we're on the verge of doing a, a tech Shabbos um, every week. We didn't pull the plug or t flick the switch yet, but that's um, on the table. And of course he's saying, he's, he's quite uh, uh, orthodox and we're not at all, but um, he's like, just do it. It's not gonna happen if you just look at it and talk about it. So more to come on that. Um, the key words for, for today, because tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, which is not one of the high holy days actually in the Jewish tradition, but it's a famous one because it's like the solstice kind of goes back to the pagan times with um, the light coming a little more and more. So the key words are miracle, victory, and light, and also family. And I'm super uh, appreciative of our family here in OGM. Um, and lastly, uh, Kiko Lab is continuing to, to co-evolve, iterate, pivot in our messaging processes. Um, and there's a lot more kind of uh, snex, snexy, sarky, sexy snarky is what I wrote, uh, fun sense making fantasy tech uh, to come. And so over to you, Lauren. So, um, you know, I've been continuously putting like tons of hours into, um, trying to create some kind of um, document, like a knowledge repository that people actually look at. So I've made like dozens of versions of this. All of them have been failures. And um, it's like- <laughs> No, the one, you shared, the one you shared just recently was beautiful. Your story of, of how you got to where you are, it's, it's gorgeous. So it's not failing. So this is so this is the latest version right here. So I keep doing it over and over again. And basically what people have told me, so this is, so this is what I imagine to be a quest template, except that from doing this template, I would say that the problem with the quest is that a quest is epic. And that means that the, if you fail, the failure is epic. 
And so what I'm trying to do with this template is to create, um, so a template is something that you follow. And so it's kind of sets an example. So what I'm trying to do is setting an example of being authentic and uh, sharing uh, what happened when I tried this, uh, you know, experiment. So, you know, I kept kind of, you know, trying to document the story without completely removing myself from it. And people just kept saying, we want a story. And so it was really hard for me to kind of like put myself in it and tell the story of what actually happened. But I just finally did it. And I feel that it's at least a more interesting document. And it so it takes it out from the, you know, like the perspective of, um, you know, kind of neutral and just being like, th this is, this is what happened to me. And this is, this is how I view it. So, um, you can take a look at it and give me feedback, but it, you know, so it, now that it's so personal, it's like, you know, I'm afraid that it's going to be hard for, for, for people to give me feedback, but I, you know, I still do want it, you know, I won't be crushed. It's, I'm, I'm used to, you know, get, uh, it, people telling me you, you need to redo it like this. And so I just kind of wanted to create that sort of environment that we can, this is a community where we can be real and share our, our problems and our failures and our successes as well. So just wanted to set that, uh, set that tone. Um, Lauren, thank you. And, and, I will say my my own reaction to this to this Miro board was a awe because it's beautiful, um, b uh, appreciation because you embedded the videos and the videos are edited like you've you've put in work over work over time over work doing this uh, so that you're you're really um, sort of it's topiary you're you're like you're pulling out the Mickey Mouse that was in the hedge that the rest of the people the rest of us might not have spotted. Um, and, and then that made me sort of stop and pause and not add things to it because it didn't feel like a place for commentary. And also because Miro doesn't have a widget that says, this is just a conversational widget, right? It would be cool if there was a, a, little, a little phone icon or a little uh, TARDIS icon or a little something that said, right here is a place where you can not damage this, this particular perspective or view, but you can chat and have feedback around the context contained right here where the icon lives, for example, right? Uh, so I added a link to this Miro board in my brain, connected it to you. And, and, and that was the most that I could, that was, that was the most I could do to weave what you've created, which is really useful and beautiful, both, which is rare, uh, into my own personal context. So it made me reflect on like the OGMiness of, okay, how what what is required so that this 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 story you have told very honestly with really lovely sort of production that includes the pieces that one would need to go listen to to, to follow the story what 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 would it take to take that a couple steps forward into an environment that allows for the conversation we're looking for and the memory sharing that we're looking for does that make sense yeah i think that the next step would be for people to add comments and have the comments be more than the ordinary comments and be like snarky comments or, or like a share like their personal perspective or like other people taking a risk and actually like you know writing the comments of something that you know um is their really personal uh, perspective cool so um, anybody uh, who wants to take a look in there and and, and offer feedback and uh and however, and then back to what Charles was saying, uh, Tiffany Schlein is a friend. Uh, she's the one who sort of started the, the technology Shabbats. Uh, her father was Leonard Schlein, uh, who wrote several books. He, he was a surgeon, but he wrote several really perceptive books. Uh, and the one that affected me a lot was The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, which I really, really enjoyed. It was one of those sort of, he, it was a premise about history that the linear alphabet really fucked up our ability to think. and. And, you know, it, it had the opposite effect of what we thought it did. Like everybody thinks, yeah, oh, awesome. We got the alphabet. We could write books. We could communicate. And he says, when we created the linear alphabet, 
we suddenly shifted our brains into linear top-down hierarchical paternalistic thinking and it sort of lines up with a bunch of other stuff so it's a big thesis it, 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 you know and then he walks it around the world and says compare pre-alphabet greece to post-alphabet greece in pre-alphabet greece you have athena and dionysus and bacchus and a whole bunch of uh, mars and you have sort of men and women creating the world together and then all of a sudden post-alphabet you have men giving birth from their head and their thigh and, and, and there's sort of a deprecation of the divine feminine and a bunch of other really, really interesting stuff. And I'm like, holy crap, really? Because I had arrived at a, at a different sort of, at a similar thesis from a very different path uh, about yin and yang and, and whatnot. But uh, um, this cool. statement about thinking re reminds me of what Tufti said about PowerPoint. Uh huh. Can you remind us of the Tufti quote? Uh, that it turns people into a, a serial line of thought with no ability to go uh, out, extend, and, and explore. So. Yeah. Everybody's seen the, the PowerPoint Gettysburg Declaration, Gettysburg Address? Uh, I'll, I'll find the link. It's really funny. It's like, what if Lincoln had used PowerPoint? You're like, oh my God. Uh, all, the mag all the magic is drained uh, nicely out of, uh, out of the address. So let's go. I have to scroll way back up to figure out Neil Doug Hamilton. Would you, will you give a link to that? Uh, link the in PowerPoint? Sure. While Neil is talking, I'll find it. Yes, yeah, so I was looking for a hook. Um, nice to see you guys here today. And sorry for not having been around for a few weeks. Um, firstly, I disagree regarding PowerPoint. Um, I think that PowerPoint played as a linear set is too linear. But played as a card set is very powerful. And so played as a card set requires the intuition to tune into the audience and see where they're at and to play that next stepping stone. And if they're ready to jump onto it, then you've already made progress. But if they're not ready to jump onto it, you can say, oh, sorry, that was the wrong slide and go to slide 27. Um, and I do that regularly when I'm with uh, diverse groups, which brings me to one of the reasons I guess I haven't been here for a little while is the, the frustration of trying to keep track of the complexity of 316 email uh, groups, multiple platforms, and try and also bring transformative influence to the places where I'm actually putting a fair bit of brain power into and heart power into in Europe. And the frustration is that there are so many people who think they're doing something useful. And they're building a platform on level three and the building goes to level seven. And they don't even know there's a level five and they don't want to look any further than level four. And it's just, it's just so frustrating and it's so difficult to lift the whole playing field to the next level. And so we can coordinate that level all we like and it ain't going to be enough. And so my frustration is that as my energy goes into these uh, attempts, I find myself in a loop that reminds me of the trauma of previous failures. And so I get to a point where it actually becomes uh, self-destructive to try and stay in that space. And yet I know that if I change what I am doing, it's not going to make the difference required for any future. And this is the problem with having, I think, a complexity lens and recognizing how close we are to absolute social and ecological collapse. And so the hard part then is how to hold that energy and to focus that energy and to bring it gently and disrupt coherence compassionately, which includes playing PowerPoint slides as, uh, as, as cards and dropping things in and seeing who's attracted. And I'm heartened by the fact that people can still see me through their barriers and through their inability to speak out honestly from within their institutions and within their consortia. And so, there's a trickle of people that are connecting deeply in the way that I think Lauren is calling for. Um, and they're, they're seeking what I can bring. But a lot of the groups I'm in, I actually feel that the immune system is trying to destroy me. And so I get to a point where the energy required to then pick up all the new content and new context that's gone under the bridge during my night, your mornings, <laughs> um, is almost too difficult to grok when the energy has been pulled from my sails. And so I, I feel, I, I used to sailboard and on days when gusty winds would come, 
there'd be calm periods where you spent balancing on your board, waiting for a bit of wind and hanging on to the uh, hanging onto the sail and suddenly this gust would come and you'd have to brace yourself if you braced too far you'd fall backwards if you didn't brace enough you get flicked forwards and so it's a bit like that it's it's like you know revving on a on a jet ski and whoa, whoa, whoa. a gust of wind comes i catch it in the sails i sail along and then phew, just peters out again and that's my my journey over the last few weeks i think i am making a difference in lifting social fields I'm seeing little bits and pieces recorded in Miro boards and PowerPoints and policy documents, but getting people to even think about the governance beyond the internal what do we get commons to actually say, what are we doing about the whole of Europe economic and cultural commons is virtually impossible. And I hear what Klaus was saying before about the, the wonder of people who are waking up to their need for nature in uh, a continent that has very little left. And so they're looking for how do we sequester uh, carbon somewhere? How do we find nature somewhere? How do we bring our increased consciousness from our complacent, uh, you know, comfortable position in the economy somewhere? Because it ain't going to happen here unless we stop doing what we're doing and face that reality and come up with systemic innovation rather than just do the wrong things writer, is a real battle. And it's good to be back with family again, thank you. But it's, it's so difficult to keep a track of where is the conversation and how to bring something meaningful to that conversation um, in the current threads I've got. It's not to diminish any of the work that's going on, but I'd love to see somewhere for how this is being integrated and synthesized and forgive me for not having been on board for a couple of weeks and it'll take a long time to catch up, but I ain't got time to go back through everything that's already under the bridge. So forgive me and nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you for, for being here in, in the first place. Um, I, don't know if, I, I don't know if this is helpful to you, but I'll, I just wanna riff on what you said for a moment, which is um, large scale societal change takes forever and then I think changes relatively quickly. Like, like all of a sudden we look back and it's like, well, crap, two years ago we were thinking like that and now we're thinking like this, but that doesn't happen very often. And it takes the work of many people who are pushing in many different corners and tugging and turning and, and putting and, and basically introducing communities to each other, uh, introducing ideas to communities, uh, pulling them all. And, and for the people doing that work, there, uh, there's little visible change and there's lots of frustration and lots of pushback, in particular, if their ideas run really contrary to the dominant conventional wisdom, which is, I think, the case for a lot of us. I think, I think, I think uh, many of us are trying to bring ideas to communities where the communities ain't that happy to hear the ideas, but there's a piece of the people that's like, yeah, that would be great, but it's never going to work because reality. And, and we'll never get there because uh, problems in the in the way and Trump the Trump apocalypse and the pandemic or whatever right but but I think a key here uh, is to keep the wind in your sails to keep your sails filled uh, through personal relationships energy whatever but then also to to find ways of being more effective in telling the story in more places and I think that that's a that's a very OGME theme all of the all of what you're saying because I think part of what we're about here is collecting up, synthesizing, and then putting back in the world the best ideas we know about how to fix the, how to, how to improve civilization to go back to what Ken picked up from the conversation yesterday. Um, just, and, just, just add very please. briefly to that, Jerry, Gen generally agree with you. And I do, everywhere I go, I do what you said. The frustration is when you're watching a 15 year project pre-bid, setting its sales for something less than is required and needed knowingly doing that because they're ignoring reality, hoping to get a big win gain in terms of economic benefit, and me knowing it ain't going to be enough, and also knowing that it's going to suck all the resources from all the places that could be doing transformative work. And I've seen this happen 327 times, right? And so if they get off on the wrong floor with all the equipment, nothing goes to the top. And there is no mechanism yet to support those that are doing the groundbreaking, sense-breaking, meaning-making, synthesizing conscious whole systems anticipatory design effort that actually leads other people into beneficial markets 
and actually gives us the resources required if we redirected those energies at a higher plane at the start. It's amazing what we could do. And it's so frustrating to watch it and to watch the, the literal, pardon the expression, clusterfuck of Brexit going on, um, what's happening with COVID and various regulations and the inability to even follow simple instructions for personal benefit, let alone for collective benefit. You know, you can see that the dynamic is not there to allow this transformative shift even though multiple incremental shifts will change the consciousness, we need stronger transformational whole systems anticipatory design leadership, and we ain't got a lot of time to do it. Thanks. And thanks, Neil. And, and, and one of the things that really frustrates me a lot over time from what you just said is when really great ideas and really powerful people have to dumb their ideas down because of assumptions about what the client will tolerate. Like, like the, the client isn't even in the conversation, but we've already stupided down the idea because, because we make a whole series or somebody made a whole series of assumptions of what's palatable, what's fundable, what's profitable, what the goals are, et cetera. And so, exactly. and so you, a whole bunch of energy goes into something that is less than it could be. So I, self I, self-censoring by less conscious gatekeepers. Exactly. Exactly. I see it all the time. Um, and, and so that makes me want, us to find and you to find our way to the most receptive organizations that are in a position to make a difference and are really like like how do we how do we find our way to the best possible partners who have resources and scope and activity in the world to to do this with them and turbocharge their efforts because that will fill our sales like crazy that will give us resources to stay alive and keep doing this and then we can propagate it to other organizations. But I, you know, I'd love to know who those organizations are and, and who's running them. Because in retrospect, you can go back and say, oh, during the 60s, it was these couple organizations that did what we look now at as pivotal, seminal work, right? Um, and so, and so what, what are those organizations in our decade here uh, and, and through, through the thick of, of all these piled on crises? Um, Thank you. And I've got to find my uh, Doug, uh, Doug Hamilton, Judy. Okay. I think I came to an idea this week that helps explain why it's so hard to have conversations that are strategic. And it goes like this. A belief can meet either of two criteria. Either it can relate to fact or it can be a tribal marker that you are belong, belonging to a group. And the idea that what we believe and what we say uh, keeps us in tune with a group that we care about is probably much more important than it fixed the, the facts. Uh, that's a pretty shocking idea. Um, a, a, an example that's fascinated me this week, I run a seminar for uh, biological researchers uh, and we meet once a week and it's been pretty serious and it's gone along very well. But in the last few weeks, it's been breaking down because in the social isolation of COVID, the people in the seminar want to be social with each other more than they want to be serious. And so the conversation about seriousness is really flagging. And you can just feel the need, the desire to be with the group. And what you're talking about is just an, an opportunity to be in the group. Uh, that's pretty strong. Uh, most of my time these days is working on my book called Garden World Politics, where the idea is that we should solve two problems simultaneously. That is how we get food and where and how we live, the aesthetics and the ethics of living. And so blending those together and avoiding the uh, agribusiness model approach to the future has been important. And of course, I'm looking for an agent and a publisher. So at some point I'll come to the group and say, help, help, help me do this. <laughs> uh, another thing that's uh, with communication that's related to the marker is I participate in a number of uh, now Zoom seminars at Stanford. And I'm really struck by the style of the younger researchers of talking so fast that you can't get a thought in. Uh, it's a bam, 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 bam style of talking. And it seems to me it really gets in the way of the speaker reflecting on what they're saying, much less the audience. 
Thank you. Um, Hamilton, do you have to bounce at the top of the hour? Okay, good, because uh, I've got Kevin Jones and I think Scott raised his hand a little earlier and then I'll go back to the queue. So Kevin? Yeah, just, you know, if you want to fund the most effective organizations, then you've got the bigger organizations who've been able to pay for metrics that the big funders uh, recognize. And so that's how new and innovative organizations don't get on the list. And <clears throat> that's also how uh, indigenous and organizations led by people of color don't get funding. So it's a, there's a selection bias around metrics uh, that are, you know, you end up funding stupid things like the United Way or their equivalent when, you know, the United Way is never where you should give your money, those sorts of things. Anyway. Makes, makes sense. And when I say I'd love to find the organizations best adapted to this, I don't mean the largest best funded with the most metrics. But I, that's I, how you will find them. See, that's the thing. You, you're going to look for the ones that are judged to be effective. <clears throat> and those are the big ones who've, who, who've made the metrics to, to, to get on those lists. Hmm. Not sure I agree with that. I mean, it depends on who you're yeah. asking, right? And how, and how they're looking. Well, that's how the funding goes. Yeah, I mean, oh, you know. totally agree with that. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Well, um, okay. I, I, I firmly disagree with your approach. So there you go. Scott? Um, my comment was about the dumbing down and this also seems to relate to what we were just talking about here about finding the right ways and the right people. My observation is that we've been told that people don't have an attention span, which mm -hmm. I think is related to um, you know, we need to dumb it down for the lowest common denominator. And yet the rise of the long form podcast, I think stands in stark contrast to that. You know, people are watching Joe Rogan for three hours talk with someone, you know, and I think that maybe it's not the organization, but the content and the format that actually enables that kind of uh, information to be taken and consumed. And, um, yeah, that, that was just the observation is that we have things that are set that in how people are behaving that are in contrast to we need to keep it shorter and shorter and shipper and simpler. And, and those are very deep conversations that are wide ranging that people are tuning in by the millions. Thank you, Scott. Um, Hamilton, Judy, Pete. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's funny. I wonder if it's easier to go later in the conversation because there's so much to build off of, of earlier in the conversation. Because I, I, I almost wanted to respond to Hank and Doug and Kevin and all you guys. Um, it's interesting. You know, the thing that's resonating for me um, is the divisiveness that, we, you know, we're talking about Brexit, right? It, it, it feels like the U.S. feels so divided that no one else has this problem, but you just reread the it's everywhere and, and why we're so divided. Um, Russell Brand had a really interesting article in New York Times the other day, take or, take or leave him, but he's, he's, he's a good writer and he wrote about Brexit and he, his last paragraph was the real thing is, the, is our isolation and, and individualism, right? It's not about being on either sides, it's about being so absorbed with the self and, 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 and consuming, right? <laughs> Just the wrong things um, that, that, that in, and I think we live in a world where we feel like we should be less isolated because of the ease with which we can connect in some ways. But I think actually it's driving more isolation and because it feels like it shouldn't be, it's even amplifying it. And I think that's what's, and I don't know how we get past that, right? Um, but that's what I think we need to go after. Um, I loved, uh, Hank, what you were saying about what, I think it was what I stand to learn from this person or where's this person right or something. I just that's so great, right? I um, and and uh, I just did this workshop. We led this workshop, a couple of workshops with this uh, professor from Harvard, Francesca Gino, and her mantra is, is "Thank you because." Uh, it's an empathy. It's an empathy thing, right? So whenever someone tells you something, even if it's the hardest thing to hear, genuinely say thank you because because it forces you to just understand. It, it just forces a different wiring in your brain to engage with that person. Now. Problem is you have to actually be in a real conversation with somebody to ha to be able to um, employ those. You can't do it on a on a message board, um, but that's you know that's where I'm thinking. That's just so up for me right now, especially as I head into the holidays and stuff, and feel so isolated and divided, and the pressures of COVID are coming in in new ways. Um, and then the last thing, you know, the 
coming back to U.S. politics, the things that piss me off the most about all this electoring stuff, electoral stuff, is that we're also they're just fucking bullying us, right? They're doing it just to twist our nipples. Pardon the thing. It's, it's they're like they do it because they know it pisses us off, and I think that's part of it. Everything that everybody else says is part of it as well. And there's a, a big long game and stuff like that, but they get juiced by pissing us off and bullying us. It fucking, it makes me so angry. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So sorry for the cussing there at the bottom, but that's what, that's the other thing I hate about all of this. It's just, it's not based on anything, but just b- bad emotion and bad intent. Let's make them squeal. Yeah. Fuck them. Fuck. I mean, sorry. Thank um, them because. <laughs> so Thank the, them because. So you've popped the lid on a super interesting set of topics, Hamilton, and about the dynamic, political dynamics in our country and all that. And there's a piece of what's going on that has to do with dignity, condescension, status, uh, status uh, attention, uh, a whole bunch of other things, which has which has metastasized into tropes like "fuck liberals," like like I, I don't I don't care what happens as long as the other people are hurt. Yeah, that's right? the number one thing is make them lose. Which which is this fatalistic? We're all going to die, so I might as well not be the one hurting the most when the truck hits the the, the, the wall or something like that. I mean, there, there's a really nihilistic kind of thing going on. Um, and the narratives of hope or connectedness or whatever else are struggling to be heard, like really struggling to find their way through this mess. Uh, so uh, if we had to design a, a civilization level case study for OGM to tackle, I don't know that we could do better than the present moment, right? Like, like we're, 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 we're presently in a, in a shit show that's perfect for what we're working on. Yeah, and Klaus put Fantasyland uh, uh, I've not read the book or watched the whole video, but I've got it in my queue class. You want to say say something about yeah. it? I mean, you know, I'm I'm sort of immersed into spiral dynamics because to me this is uh, just a form of sense making that is that is easy to understand. And we talked before that Donald Trump and Trumpers per se are in red. Uh, it's a, a violent form of expressing yourself. And then it's blue, which is the next level up which are evangelicals and the character the characteristic of blue is that we believe in things that are not real you know we believe in magic we believe in things that we can pray into existence following that is orange so we are pretty much in orange and then you have green which is you know, the environmental the uh, uh, connecting connectivity with nature and so on so this what we have right now is dominant bright blue expression and you can't ration with these people because they truly believe things that don't exist. So it's like it's like arguing with with an evangelical who wants to convince you that Jesus walked on water. You know? and, and there's like nothing you can do to to say otherwise. And that is the, the this this and these are the same people who declared someone that declare someone an enemy of God and then feel free to kill them because you know, it's an enemy of God. So blue is, um, is what we're trying to escape. You know, we're trying to move out of blue and the, 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 um, the, the, the worldview that is being threatened here by a, a significant portion uh, to, to, uh, of the American public is creating these enormous tensions. I mean, that's sort of my interpretation, but there's like no reason or logic or, or rationality. So we, the, the characteristic of what spiral dynamics is trying is is conveying is that each of these colors speaks their own language. You, know, you have to the, the words you choose, the paradigms you 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 uh, that you use um, are different in red versus blue. Shoot, we missed Jay. Sorry, uh, uh, Hamilton. You want to just no? I just want to close that and um, and going back to what Doug said and Bill enough is I have a quote um, I have all these quotes there and one is and I don't know who said it was that beliefs are the enemy of facts right and and you know um, I read that every time and I hate that it's like but I think you can fix that but that's where we are right now we live in that world right where it, they can be the enemies of facts and this magical thinking Klaus I'm just reading about this fantasy land it's so true yeah um, Kurt Emerson is super interesting uh, Doug 
uh, <laughs> just to follow up on that, it's not that the belief is the enemy of the fact, it's the desire to be a member of the tribe by exercising what the tribe believes. I think that's so important. Uh, and so it's not that we go after our enemies. We appear to go after our enemies in order to bind ourselves to our tribe. Hmm. I completely agree. Yeah. And I just want to surface a, a, a thought that just keeps troubling me about spiral dynamics, which is articulated in what Klaus was saying. So I, I, I think that framing all Trumpians as red is part of the problem. Like, like, like those poor red people, we must uplift them because we're teal and like we need to bring, we need to bring those poor people to our level is, is what I hear a lot from spiral dynamics. And, and a whole bunch of Trumpians might just be smarter than a whole bunch of other people because they see the system as thoroughly broken as it was before Trump showed up. Like, like Trump inherited a, a, and co-opted and ate a whole series of dysfunctional things that were happening in the world which caused a bunch of people to go, oh, this guy, he's the only one who's actually talking about how fucked up the system is. And many of the people backing him are placing wagers on the table that are these deadly civilization level wagers, but they're wagering that if the system is broken enough, maybe we can find our way to a different system, maybe, maybe. And, and, I, don't, and I, I don't think that some, some not, there's plenty of racist, homophobic, sexist, horrible people following Trump because he's trolling for them, because that's the, the bulk of people who can, who can vote for him. But there's also a bunch of people who are playing strategy here uh, at a civilizational level. And I don't, I don't like what they're doing. I don't, I don't like his approach at all. I think we can get there a completely different way. But, but part of what lights Trump's followers up is being treated as one down to smarter people who have better ideas who are going to pull them into civilization. And, 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 and I admire sort of the an analytic frameworks of spiral dynamics. And I just, that's what doesn't give me, that's one of the two ways that, that using it doesn't give me any traction because I'm like, crap, I, like there's, there's this definite notion of, of, of levels of maturity, intelligence, value that are, that to me are implied by the colored levels of the framework, Klaus and Neil. Yeah, there is, I mean, spiral dynamics, it has vertical and lateral. You know, horizontal levels. So within each color, there are there is a spectrum of intelligence and cognition, but there is a mindset that's prevalent within each color. And then the other thing is, teal is like way out there, aspirational. We have no idea what it is, but yellow is, I think, the color that is the emerging quality, because yellow is uh, a a systems focused way of thinking. You know, it, it removed from emotion, systems focused. So when you look at the description of yellow, I think that's where we mentally, emotionally need to merge into. So Klaus, can you, can you confidence that some Trump followers are yellow? Um, yellow is an emerging, an emerging uh, 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 quality. Um, I haven't really, um, yeah, that's a, I haven't focused on that question as to who is there already. I mean, is that a possibility in your in your mind? For example, the author of uh, this book that we were just reading here um, on on uh, fantasy land, I would say this guy is yellow. You know, okay. As an example. Yeah, uh, Kurt Anderson. Um, Neil Van Judy. Just to pick up on what Klaus was saying, I will bet you there are apparatchiks behind Trump that are yellow. But Trump isn't. And so there are systems thinkers who could be doing it for good, who aren't. They're doing it for personal benefit. And so this is the, the, the half of the spiral is about I and half of the spiral is about we. And so the, the shifting between I and we is critical. And so the tribalism element that Doug and others have mentioned comes in on one side, but not on the other side. Right, the tribalism side, it's more about personal benefit and the, the life conditions, the value sets and the behaviors are the three critical elements here. The Trumpians are more likely to survive in a collapsing world than any of us here. Why? Because they're actually prepared to kill 
They've got the guns. <laughs> They're going to go out and do it. And they don't give a shit about the rest of nature anyway because they don't see it. They, don't, they have a higher power which is driving it. Now, now that I've said all of that controversial stuff, each of us has all of these in us, regardless of what level we've got to. And it comes down to what order we play them in, which is some element of cognitive and consciousness overriding of reactive rather than responsive. And the more conscious we become, the more responsive we can be. And the more conscious we become of systemic conditions, the more complexity we can see and sense. And the more complexity we can see and sense, the harder it is to actually make sense of the amount of messed up, fragmented uh, challenges we have today, which is why it's not as easy as just do it, right? It's actually make choices based on the best understanding you have of the system, which requires sense making, and it also requires paying off one for the other in terms of priorities. The energy goes where the attention is, where is the energy, where is the attention, and the, atten and the energy goes where the attention is, and the attention goes where the energy is. And so then you play them to tribalism, you change the life conditions by throwing in politics or throwing in bushfires or throwing in hurricanes or throwing in COVID and people will regress to the level that suits them at that time in whatever level they've reached. And so like uh, Claire Graves, who instigated the work that then went into spiral dynamics, said very much, we're on a continual spiral of development. However, it's not for him as an individual to decide which of those is best because it depends on life conditions. And so it's pretty hard to be having transcendental thoughts of being chased by a guy with a machete or a shotgun, right? So we have a, a noble obligation with the complacency of our current comfort levels, with the current amount of economy, the current amount of, of technology, to be raising the awareness and the consciousness of as many as possible. And we have to do it as I said before, disrupting coherence compassionately, gently lifting where we can, not expecting everybody to be able to go there, but showing them stepping stones. And I heard a wonderful quote the other night on a rerun of Game of Thrones where the three-eyed raven says, chaos is a ladder. Chaos is a ladder if you can make sense of it. But to people who can't make sense of it, it's not a ladder, it's chaos. And so the magicians amongst us have to be magic. And anything that looks like magic is beyond the sense of those who are currently watching it. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, Judy, Ken, uh, and then Pete. Yes, I'm going to go back to kind of a check-in point because I've been wandering this range between um, large organization impact and local community impact. And I agree that the extent to which we can identify the large groups that have the capacity to provide high impact to the systems of change is really desirable. But each level, whether it's the individual in the community or the large one, requires the human connection of developing the way to work together. And my sense is that that's where we need to put our energy is on the human connection. And that's why I like what we were talking about in terms of listening to people well and attempting to truly understand their perspective. Because the only way to engage people is to develop a shared vision. And even if it's a small step, it's a positive small step. And that shift in that one person may, without my knowing it, cascade into 20 other people that that person knows because their viewpoint has been altered. And so I think it's very important for us to focus on sympathetic listening, if you will, or good listening, so that we actually can enter and understand the story that we really don't want to be part of at all, but need to understand with some compassion in order to find ways to shift viewpoint. And I tend to think of it not so much in terms of hierarchy of impact, that's of course really important, but the bigger the ship, the harder to turn as a rule. <laughs> and so somehow I think if we can consciously identify and use our behaviors 
to in every interaction with every encounter help that openness occur, that sharing occur, then the cascade effect is high because that will carry from the individual or group we're speaking with to the other individuals and groups with whom they interact. And it's, a, it's kind of a conversion wave. I don't know how to say it very well, but I've been encouraged with some good things that are happening locally and with some organizations that are much larger that are starting to put conscious energies in constructive issues in professional societies, scientific groups, they're becoming more engaged in sharing their knowledge and perspective in ways that will help people understand the issues we're facing and the things that can be done to do it. And so to the extent that we can engage organizations comprised of large groups of individuals, then those individuals become spin-off points everywhere. And I know this is very diffuse, but that kind of makes it ogm <laughs> um, But I just want to put it in because it's so easy to become frustrated and, and dwell in the imminent apocalypse, whether it's the social apocalypse or the planetary apocalypse. And that's not how we move to a better place. So that's my injection for today. Thank you, Judy. Uh, the, the analogy that fills my sails a bit or lets me cope with the scales of change we're talking about is that the things we're trying to change are more like swarms than very large crude carriers. And if you think of it as one big vessel that needs to turn and will turn very slowly because it has inertia like you wouldn't believe, um, rather than one visibly large object that may composed of a whole series of independent actors who, who when they turn in concert can turn very quickly and are, are much nimbler than the large entity. And so I know that there's huge institutions we're talking about, but I think also that individual action is really easier to do than it ever has been. Like, like we can act outside of institutions more than we ever could in, in, in history. Just look at how people are trying to source their children's education in the middle of the pandemic and we, we know what happens there. So, so maybe a murmuration of starlings is, is, a, is a good metaphor for how some of these things need to change. Um, uh, Neil? Just wanted to make the observation that Spiral Dynamics talks about multiple levels of self-organization and it's the value memes which create the platform for that level of self-organization. So murmurations can happen on every level, right? And the thing is that if you can self-organize within life conditions with behaviors that work for you, uh, then you will become effective. And that's the, the story of civilization and the story of colonization and the story of destruction. But if your worldview is insufficient to take into account the stuff that Kevin's working on, sorry, that um, uh, who was working on, the, oh, Doug, that Doug is working on, right? How do you get a garden to function? How do you get people to coordinate at a neighborhood scale? How do you get an economy of scale? How do you get an economy that works with an ecosystem of players? All of these are self-organizational models which will be restricted to the level that is capable from the critical mass or the, the center of gravity of that group. The challenge we have is to lift the level at which we're self-organizing by lifting the level of consciousness and ethics with which we're underpinning all the rules of self-organization. And the challenge you've got in America is that your self-organizational model around the elections and the census and all the blue, you know, functional stuff that makes it all work has been upended now by the orange, which is saying this is how we do it for business purposes and concentrate the wealth in the hands of a few while making everybody else believe that, you know, they've all got it better than they've ever had it before um, with 11% poverty, right? Um, how do we get that level lifted unless we tackle both individual players within the swarm and have some transformational leadership from those who can demonstrate by example and so the flip side to your point, Jerry, about which organizations are the ones supporting this is to, for OGM to create the strange attractor to which those who are ready come, right? And that's how chaos and chaos work is that you create the attractor for things to, be, to gravitate towards. And if we can get the bid right, 
as what it is that we stand for and why is it we stand for it, and here's the tools we can give, and this is the energy and the commitment we put to it, then people will come, right? Because there, there's a transformational leader in every organisation I've been into, generally trapped three levels below the CEO who thinks they're doing it. Thank you. Um, Ken, then Pete, and then we're going to be at the end of our call. Uh, this is going back a little bit from some earlier stuff that was said, but for some reason, the Wizard of Oz popped into my head, um, Neil, when you were talking about, um, you know, the people behind Trump. And it's like, you know, what I loved about the Wizard of Oz is that for a long time, you know, the, 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 the flames and the big head, like, oh, I am the great and powerful Oz, terrifies people and, you know, um, and then the little dog goes over and pulls the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So where's our little dog to pull back the curtain on the people behind this and show that we're all being manipulated in a way here? Because I think back to hearing Lawrence Lessig speak last year when he was saying that you know his research uh, is showing that 92% of Americans are in agreement that the, the government is not working for us. We, uh, we have that alignment. So instead of this red blue divide, there is, there's a huge alignment. There's huge agreement that things are not going well. Um, and then people get split into defending, you know, either side of it or blaming the blaming things. I, years ago, um, right after Bush landed on the aircraft carrier with mission accomplished, I was asked to run a, a, a cafe for peace activists and business people. And forgive me if I've already told this story, but you know, I didn't want to do it. I told the woman who was organizing, I said, I don't want to do this. She said, why not? I said, because peace activists are the most violent people I know. They're out there with no blood for oil, no blood for oil. There's very little room to move a peace activist mind. Um, and sure enough, you know, I got there and I said, this is Jennifer. She's our graphic recorder. She'll capture today's output. And I was immediately told, you can't use capture. That's war language. And that's the sort of reactivity that was in the room. So the first two rounds were a single um, instruction. You were to sit at your table of four and tell the story of the first time that you realized that um, peace was important to you. What woke you up to peace being something valuable? And after two rounds of that, in, in the space of an hour, we went from peace activists and business people who had great animosity towards each other to everybody in this room has told a very touching story about how they woke up to peace being valuable. And now we're in a position where we have a collective understanding of each other and of, of peace. So I think there are, going to Judy's listening, you know, there are ways to work with groups of people who are at odds with each other to get them to come into some kind of space where they say, I don't want to be your enemy. I don't want to see you as your as my enemy. I want to work together on things that are important. So let's do that. But don't in, in Aikido, you know, you don't meet force with force because everything moves in a circle. You know, you see it coming and you move with it. So if we come at, we have to solve the red blue divide by being the right ones or the smarter ones or higher up on the spiral, we're going to fail big time. But if we can, if we can, you know, listen deeply and find out what these other people care about that we see as other and grant them legitimacy, then we have a way in. We can pull the curtain back on the man behind the curtain and have them see that's just gas and fire you know and we've got the real power here so thanks for the wizard of Oz. um i'll have what he's having <laughs> um ken thank you that that was really beautifully put from a like really ogme and heartfelt kind of place i, I appreciate that because that because you, know, you, like, you voiced a lot you of know i'm from oz favorite. don't you yeah yeah, yeah. um pete uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I missed part of the call, and um, and so for what it's worth, uh, I, I didn't get engaged on the same uh, the same topics, even though they, they sound interesting and fascinating. Um, uh, two quick things. Uh, one of them is that I feel this this past week feels like uh, we've been making a lot of background progress on on OGME kinds of things, um, uh, communication tools, um, free Jerry's brain. Um, uh, uh, understanding uh, the forum facilitation better, things like that. So uh, nothing big to report, but um, things are percolating along, which feels really good. And then um, the content thing I wanted to share was actually an oddball off topic thing, I think, but still it's, it's exciting for me. I've been uh, super excited about space since I was a kid. 
um, probably since the moon landings. Um, so I know it's not exciting for everybody, and, and I'm also certain that, that there are people who think it's a big waste of time, but I kind of don't. Um, anyway, the, the recent um, SpaceX launch of SN8 was spectacular. Um, and and it, it's a funny thing because for an iterative, iterative engineer, from an iterative engineering uh, perspective, it was like a mind-blowing success. And it was super inspirational, super exciting. Um, they, they've got this big rocket that used to look like a, a farm silo, and now it actually has a, a top on it, so it looks cool and, and retro and everything, and it's huge. And it got way up high in the air, and then they did cool things like uh, they did the belly flop maneuver where the, they actually turned the thing over and made it start coming down, and it came down perfectly. They had it, everything under control. It was going to the right spot. And then at the very end, it actually blew up. But <laughs> um, so it's it's been funny watching the people um, the people reporting on this and writing about it on the on the, the you know both on the press and just people talking about it. It's like they struggle with this. How do you say that it ended up being a spectacular explosion, but really it was a big success? So there have been a lot of easy memes, you know, like um, I don't know, you know, positive and negative kind of you know things things go really well and then they go bad or things go bad when they fail or the the smart ones are the ones who say um, things have an end and how it ended is not, not necessarily um, the way it went. So the end is not the, the whole thing. So I watched the video of the shot and with no background on it, just knowing a bit about SpaceX, having watched the Dragon launches and other kinds of things. And I was like, I was fascinated and I was inferring a few of the things you just said. And then when it blew up on the pad, I'm like, well, that's not too bad. And then I saw the final screen where they have the Chiron that says, hey, terrific success team, really love that, which looked like spin because it's like, uh, there's smoke on the ground and there's like a little little heap of metal sitting on the, on the launch pad. Uh, that Chiron doesn't seem to match. What would have helped me a lot would be like, then slide in from the right, a bunch of check boxes like, Today we proved this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, and this, and they all worked really, really well. We didn't happen to stick the landing. You know, th that simple sort of affordance, uh, because, because I'm crazy impressed with what, how SpaceX is, how quickly, how, how well they're just doing all the things that they're doing. Like it, it's, it's nuts. Uh, and then one of the little pieces that, that floated through my radar yesterday was that SpaceX is now the world's most valuable private company Seriously, I didn't know that. So, so sorry, Elon is Tesla, which is more valuable than like all the automakers. Uh, and this is just nuts. So he is Tony Stark, obviously, uh, but also a jerk and other kinds of things. But, but the scale at which um, this conglomerate of things is causing motion in the world is really impressive. And the, the, the ways that they communicate are actually incredibly impressive. So my little fix of checkboxes would have taken like somebody with a little bit of PowerPoint just uh, going zoop zoop. Anyway, it was, it was cool to watch. Um, thank you for your enthusiasm and your report. And um, we're at the half. Does anybody have any wrapping comment for now? Uh, I would like to do some wrapping. Uh, Lauren, I don't know if, if wrapping is, is useful for check-in calls. I think it's probably better for um, themed, you know, projecty calls. Uh, so I'll, so I'm, I'm looking now just for whoever would like to uh, offer any thoughts to, to wrap this call, but not in the sense of, of the actual wrapping exercise. Uh, Ken? Yeah, Charles mentioned that it's the first night of Hanukkah. And my understanding of Hanukkah is that um, uh, the, there was a, um, a ruler who forbade the Jewish people from practicing their religion. Um, not unlike a situation we might have right now where certain things are being prohibited. And there was a terrible battle and they won and um, the warriors went into the temple and they took their spears and drove them into the ground and placed uh, uh, lamps on top. But they only had enough oil for one night. And the miracle was that the um, oil actually lasted for eight nights. So it is a time of miracles of light, of thinking we don't have enough light to survive this darkness in this dark time of year, but actually 
we each are the oil that is going to be the miracle that's going to keep it going. So I think OGM is a, a perfect um, example of uh, the miracle of, of the Festival of Lights. So be your, as Buddha, I believe the Buddha's last words were, be a light to each other. So. Uh, Charles Kent has set a high bar. Go ahead. I, I just I, I want to thank you, Ken, for coming back to that and opening that up. And um, just just to add on um, the other. So um, as I was just reading yesterday, trying to get in, in gear, um, <clears throat> it was originally um, a unique, a unique holiday in, in, the, in the tradition um, in that it was um, man oriented. So it was actually celebrating the victory, which was the, the first miracle kind of against the odds. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the rabbis um, injected uh, God in, into it with the light thing. Um, and so it's like this double, you know, bridging, bridging the, the human victory miracle to the spiritual. So just, yeah. So cool. against the odds, victory. Also, also one of the few Jewish holidays that's not tied to the calendar because it, it marks a, a victory. It's usually they're tied to the phases of the moon and, you know, all this harvest stuff and, well, it, 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 it just happens to be around the solstice and that's pretty ancient stuff with the light. And so, mm, yeah. <laughs> Did anybody anyway, see the Northern but, Lights last night? They were allegedly uh, on full display much further south than usual. We had dense fog last night, so there was no Northern lighting. Um, Monday will be a full uh, solar eclipse and apparently it will be spectacular somewhere. Cool. <laughs> Anyway, South um, America. So thanks, everybody. This has been an awesome call. I will post it online, and we will see you on the intertubes. Yay. Happy, happy. Bye for now. Nice to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye.